So now let's talk about this idea in popular culture. So what's happening with this individual, which is created by all this art we just saw? And let's go look at Mark Twain's The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Mark Twain writes Tom Sawyer, very popular boys' novel. And then he writes Huck Finn, which is regarded as one of the three most important American novels of all time. So this is no Tom Sawyer. There's something going on here. And uh, Huck is running away, and he hooks up with Jim, who's a runaway escaping slave. And the two of them are on a raft going down the Mississippi. And <clears throat> Huck is continually faced with the dilemma, should I turn in Jim in? Because he's an escaped slave. He says, I'm stealing Mrs. Watson's property. I mean, did she, you know, how can, she's going to buy another one? We're just going to get the money. Um, it's her property. And it's illegal. And the, every Sunday the preacher's telling him it's immoral. He's going to go to hell. And he says, all right then, I'll go to hell. It was awful thoughts and awful words, but they were said. And we know that he's right. That he, his inner moral voice is a more valid guide to human action than society's laws or organized religion. So we're talking about uh, Adventures of Huckleberry Finn and you think, you know, what is it, what's the moral lesson of the story? What's the moral story? And it's that Huck Finn acts out of his own native um, sense, and <clears throat> we know he's doing the right thing. And this is regarded as uh, important enough that Ernest Hemingway says, all modern American literature comes from one book, <coughs> excuse me, by Mark Twain, called Huckleberry Finn. American writing comes from that. There was nothing before. There has been nothing as good since. So uh, <coughs> that's a pretty good endorsement. And it, it's part of a whole modern ethos um, we see in the mystery story, so great mystery writers of the uh, 30s and 40s were Raymond Chandler and Dashiell Hammett. And Raymond Chandler uh, wrote an essay called The Simple Art of Murder. And it was mostly about uh, preferring the American... Um, detective story over the English mystery story. But there's a famous phrase in it. Down these mean streets a man must go, who is not himself mean, who is neither tarnished nor afraid. The detective must be a complete man, and a common man, and yet an unusual man. He must be, to use a rather weathered phrase, a man of honor. And then, that's every movie. <coughs> Uh, you know, it's uh, Stagecoach with John Wayne. It's the Maltese Falcon with Humphrey Bogart. It's Shane with Alan Ladd. It's Riddick with Vin Diesel. It's the Bourne Identity with Matt Damon. <coughs> it's Saul with Angelina Jolie. And then we get the... Um, whole unfoldings of all kinds of issues. So we get the Dirty Harry movies. Well, first we get the Spaghetti Westerns with um, Clint Eastwood, which is, I mean, that is, that's a whole lecture on movies, so it's a whole other thing. But then Dirty Harry, Harry Callaghan brings justice with his 44 Magnum. <laughs> The police are corrupt. They won't do it. The courts won't do it. He has to do it. 
And then it gets interesting. Um, in Line of Fire, he is on the bumper of JFK's car and fails to jump and take the second bullet. So he's the only <coughs> Secret Service agent who ever lost the president. And so he's in the wasteland. He's in counterfeiting. Secret Service guards the president and does counterfeiting. <laughs> that's the two things it does. What they have to do with each other, but that's what they do. And then there's a threat, a new threat on the current president and the bad guy, Malkovich, <coughs> is commu <coughs> excuse me, I ate too many chips. <coughs> the bad guy is communicating with uh, Clint, the Clint Eastwood character. So he's put on the case. And uh, this time he jumps and takes the bullet and he's wearing a vest. So it's the Percival Arthurian romance. Percival is a knight who fails to act spontaneously, <clears throat> doesn't uh, heal the king, is exiled to the wasteland, eventually gets a second chance and heals the king. And so here we have these fundamental myths underlying the structure of, in this case, Western culture, and they become our current movies. And then Gran Torino, uh, Clint Eastwood's getting old. Here, his wife has just died. <clears throat> He's got lung cancer. He lives in Detroit, which is falling apart. Uh, he was an, he's a retired auto worker. And he took, he was given the last Gran Torino car that Ford made because he worked on that production line when he retired. And uh, Hmong, Vietnamese Hmong mountain people have moved into his neighborhood. He's, <laughs> who are these people? And he's a, he's a uh, Vietnam War vet, so he's not too sympathetic to them, but eventually they take him in, they feed him, he's uh, getting along with them. There's some bad uh, gang members in the neighborhood, and he deals with them. And the way he deals with them, even though he's uh, Clint Eastwood, he can't get all of them. So he challenges them, reaches for his cigarettes. They think he's going for a gun and shoot him. They've committed murder. They're all going to jail. And uh, he gives the young Hmong boy his car and his tools, and he'll have a new life. So he's a bodhisattva now that instead of being a, now we sort of Buddhism comes into the, into the story. It's not just Arthurian romances. So we have these incredibly individualistic movies. How many people have seen Gattaca? Okay, how many people have seen The Truman Show? And how many people have seen Clockwork Orange? Okay, highly recommended movies. Uh, I cannot watch Clockwork Orange. It's one of the two movies I can't watch. I mean, I saw it once, but it is so morally difficult that uh, I ain't going to watch it again. Uh, the Truman Show is a hoot, and it's not about, um, I'll tell you the, quickly the story, but he's a happy-go-lucky guy working in an ad agency or something like that, and says good morning to all his neighbors every morning. But he begins to notice fishy things going on. Why does the same car keep circling around the block? Turns out he was gotten from, as a baby from uh, an orphanage, and he's been brought up by actors, and everybody around him is an actor, and he's on a 24-hour-a-day reality show. He's a star, and he doesn't know it. And his whole life is this, the Truman Show. And they've got everything planned for him. But he begins to want to get out. He begins, there's something going on, and he wants to get out. And eventually, he breaks out, and we all cheer for him. Now, if I ask, what's it about? A lot of my students would say, well, you know, surveillance. We're all 
being watched all the time, even if there's no cameras or phones or monitoring us. It's not what it's about. But right now, I'm trying to act like a teacher. I'm trying to, you know, be impress you as a teacher. You're all trying to act as students. What would a student do? How do I? I got to look attentive. I got to look at the teacher. I got to pay attention, right? I got to. Maybe I should take notes. And so we're all acting these roles. What if you stop acting? What if you just start being you? Pardon my language. You know, it would be great one one day one of you would say. You know what? Fuck this shit. I, I, I gotta go get dinner. <laughs> uh, you know, it's that's what Truman does. You know, he's he's all of us. We're all acting. You're acting like a daughter, or you're acting like a son, or you're acting like a student, or I'm acting like a, a teacher. What, what is there a real you under that? <laughs> that's what that movie's about. Uh, so these are inc these movies are in about incredible struggles to be an individual, and then we get one of the great movies of all time, struggling to make a better self. So this started as a lightweight comedy. How many people have seen Groundhog Day? And it's now it just keeps moving up everybody's list of you know the ten greatest movies, and. Um, it's being realized that this is just one of the great movies of all time. So it's about this really um, obnoxious TV weatherman who's hoping to get a news job somewhere. He has to go to Punxsutawney, uh, Pennsylvania to cover Groundhog Day. He's really cynical about it. And he gets trapped that he goes out. He covers it. Okay, we're here at Groundhog Day. They're going to see if the groundhog will see a shadow. This is it going to be spring because he's a weatherman? And okay, and he can't leave because there's a snowstorm. So I got to stay at the bed and breakfast and then he gets up the next morning and the clock radio comes on and it's the same DJs with the same music saying, what's this? It's Groundhog Day again. He goes on, he has to do the show again. It's only once, right? Next day again. So he's, to him, the days go by. To the people in Puxatawney and the rest of his TV crew, it's always just Groundhog Day. It's just today. It happens once. Well, what do you do in this circumstance? Well, he figured out he can easily rob a bank truck, so he's got plenty of money for the day, because he, he, he knows what they're going to do because he saw them yesterday. He picks up the money bags, and then he can hit on a girl. He gets he picks up girls, you know, to spend the night with, and he's having a good time, and he realizes he can eat all the pastries he wants. He's not going to get fat. He's not going to get tooth decay, because tomorrow he's going to wake up and get to do it again. After a lot of that, it's like, this ain't fun anymore. And eventually commits suicide. Wakes up the next day. Keeps committing suicide. Wakes up the next day. And eventually it occurs to him. In the meantime, his producer, um, uh, Annie McDowell, great actress, um, he's sort of hitting on her, but he's a jerk and he says, you know, what if I make myself a better person? I've got unlimited time here. You know, it goes on for maybe 10, 10 years of this, thousands of days. We, we can, he, that, the movie doesn't say, but he masters the piano, stuff like that. What if I use this to make myself a better person? So what people realized about the movie is we're all in Groundhog Day. Every day is tomorrow. What are you going to do with tomorrow? How about using it to make yourself a better person? Um, and it, in, um, I write about it in my book, but uh, he, Friedrich Nietzsche talks about the German philosopher. What if one day a demon came to you and said, this day that you're living now, you're going to live over and over. What would you do? 
well, you'd want it to be a pretty good day. Uh, but his point is, that's us. You only, you know, you get one life. What are you going to do with it? So this movie brings that home better than any other movie, and it's become one of the great movies of all time. And a movie that's come and gone, but I put the slide in when it was, it just came out. It's such a hoot. He's still dead, but he's getting warmer about a girl who has a zombie for a boyfriend. <laughs> and he's trying to become a better person. <laughs> so we've been addressing in popular culture, what is an individual? And so you always have this question, what will the new whatever be? What will be the new individual? And again, these are very old slides, so, but you're going to be familiar with all these, and they're new ones now. But there are these books. That, there's a, a book called Difficult Men, and it's about the long-term TV dramas. So The Sopranos, The Wire, Mad Men, and Breaking Bad. And these are regarded as... The Wire is regarded as maybe the greatest TV show of all time. It's just too difficult to watch because it's about Baltimore and it's about everybody from drug dealers up to the police to the politicians. It's all tied together in one drama. Major drug dealers are the actors. <laughs> it's just incredible, the whole story of, of that show. But it's so such a downer and so difficult it uh, ran its course. Mad Men just ended. I showed you that commercial uh, in the, for Coca-Cola in the last scene. But um, John Hamm created it. And Breaking Bad is just incredible. So it all began, the modern ones, with The Sopranos. Tony Soprano says, every day's a gift. It's just, does it have to be a pair of socks? <laughs> so he's a, a, mafia, a mafia boss seeing a shrink. And Walter White, who was a chemistry teacher, he says, you clearly don't know who you're talking to, so let me clue you in. I'm not, I'm not in danger, Skyler. I am the danger. And then um, Dennis Cuddy in uh, Wise, the game done changed, Slim Charles. Game's the same, just got more fierce. <laughs> Don Draper. What you call love was invented by guys like me to sell nylons. <laughs> so he, he's a very difficult, cynical life. So those are our individuals today or who, are, you know, anybody watch House of Cards? Um, so there, there are so many great ones now. A really terrific is Yellowstone with, um, who's the actor? Guy was in, the, if, if you build it, they will come. If you Actually, if you build it, he will come. Field of Dreams? Yeah, who is the star of Field of Dreams? Anyway, he's the star of Yellowstone about an aging uh, rancher who has this huge ranch in Wyoming and bankers are trying to take it over. And it's a really incredible drama. So here are these morally questionable figures who are our current heroes. I mean, this guy is a mafioso gangster who kills people with his bare hands. This is a cynical ad agency who sells cigarettes. This is a former high school chemistry teacher who becomes a major um, drug lord, meth maker. And this is a Baltimore drug dealer. Um, they are our heroes. In defiance of all attempts to suppress it, a new individual is emerging with a deeper realism, confronting moral ambiguity, and a continuing stru struggle to create a self. So that's, you know, the world we're, that's one look at the world we're in. And obviously there could be many others. <laughs>